we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Mary Beth Terry, who will be speaking on inferring causality in observational epidemiology. Thank you. So I have the first case study now um, to, uh, to discuss a non-controversial topic of the environment in breast cancer. <laughs> so I want to do that first by starting with the bigger picture. And um, this is about cancer, but almost any chronic disease also um, uh, this would apply to, as well as neurodegenerative diseases. So for most diseases, what we see, and particularly cancers, what we see is a uh, part of the pie, if you, if you will, um, is clustering within families, and so a lot of that is thought to be uh, determined by genes. And then the bulk of most disease is what we have traditionally always called sporadic disease, because um, those are diseases where you have no family history. Is this something? Do I need to do anything here? No. Okay, great. So, the interesting aspect of that is, as we know, the causes of, bre of breast cancer as well as other cancers now um, are, are a multitude of causes. They include viruses, they include bacteria, they include behavioral factors, they include, include hormonal factors, um, environmental factors. And what is um, probably the only thing in common of this list that nobody really in this room or elsewhere would dispute are known causes now of cancer um, is that really they, all of the human evidence have all come from observational studies. So um, although we can appreciate all of the caveats about observational study, the reality is the perfect can sometimes be the enemy of the good. And the reality is for human studies, um, there may not be um, the natural experiment for every kind of setting that we, need, um, that we would like. But just as important and sometimes overlooked as observational studies are the um, main study design that we use to find all of the causal genes for um, cancer, which obviously are a much longer list and growing every day. But again, nobody in this room or elsewhere would dispute that any of these major genes are not causal in cancer. So we have used observational designs to find many, if um, uh, uh, and if not all, of the ca causes now for cancer. Um, and so what's of interest, I think, for the discussion generally is in thinking about the environment, what we now know is there's really no false dichotomy anymore, that the genes that have been found in family-based studies over time um, really are the same genes that are important for sporadic disease, if you will. And so those genes may be mutated through somatic mutation. They may be altered through epigenetic mutations. But BRCA1 is important um, within families, but it's also important for many of the women who do not have a family history. So the discovery of these genes in this particular type of study design can be useful for all women, not just women with a family history. And likewise, we could say the discovery of these environmental factors, which for the most part have come from studies of unrelated individuals, not family-based studies, are important to all individuals, even those with a family history. So, what we really, though, need to do, because we know it's not just genes, it's not just the environment, but for all chronic diseases, in particular cancer, it's the interaction between the genes and the environment. So how do we best study, most efficiently study, using observational design, gene-environment interactions? So for the most part, um, people have studied gene-environment interactions in the kind of setting of where they collected the environmental data. So here I just um, show up a forest plot of, you know, one of many, many, many hundreds of studies now you can see where um, there's been um, sometimes zero gene-environment interaction detected um, within this kind of setting, which, um, you know, you can throw numbers at a problem, but that just makes it a pr more precise estimate. But it, it hasn't yielded um, uh, what people thought it might. Um, whereas what we have found over time, which has been, I would argue, more revealing in terms of understanding some of the causes of cancer, is using family-based studies in rich sampling to understand the environment and gene interaction within that setting. And that's what I'll talk about today. So again, nobody would argue that the um, randomized control trial can often be the best study for inference, but for generalizability, um, 
you know, there's always a trade-off, just like sensitivity and specificity. And so somewhere in the middle, you might have, in an observational way, a hybrid between um, sometimes the efficiency of a case control study and the temporality of a cohort study. And I would argue that, for observational design, might be the most effective, like the nested case control designs, the case cohort designs, particularly for understanding biomarkers um, and their association with cancer. So um, one of the things that you can accomplish, too, by thinking about an enriched sample is, is really just um, the um, uh, fewer number of people that you have to follow over time to have the same um, uh, precision and the same number of people with an outcome. So these kind of family-based studies can be um, uh, much more statistically efficient than some of these average risk cohorts. Um, and in particular, for thinking about a gene-environment interaction, this is our family-based cohort that we've been studying and following now for close to 20 years. Um, what we've, we know for breast cancer, but this is, again, true for every cancer as well as most chronic diseases, is that when you say you have a family history, um, to, to uh, put people into two buckets is really a false dichotomy because there's an underlying distribution of absolute risk. And so this is within our family cohort. Um, this represents about 18,000 individuals. What I've highlighted here in pink would be people who have, based on clinical cut points of high risk, a lifetime um, breast cancer risk of 20% or more. This is usually the threshold that a lot of insurance companies use to, um, uh, to pay for um, MRIs. It's also a threshold used to consider risk-reducing surgeries as well as chemopreventive agents and that sort of thing. But what I also highlight in orange is really the average risk. So if you say 1 in 8 or 12 percent lifetime risk, so an enriched cohort where you follow family members over time prospectively, albeit it's not um, a population ascertained anymore, but again, for inference, for cohorts, we don't need that um, as much as you would need it in a case control setting. We have a lot of people who would give you precision for average risk as well. So this kind of enriched cohort allows you to ask questions that are pertinent to average risk as well as high risk and have enough power for that. So where are we with the environment in breast cancer? So this was a paper that was published this past year, um, just showing the global map of breast cancer. And so many people know how common breast cancer is in North America, Australia. It's been very common. But now you can see worldwide just the difference of 20 years and how um, uh, widespread breast cancer is around the world, and particularly um, early onset breast cancer. And lab data, this is um, uh, work from uh, Dr. Birnbaum's lab at um, NIHS. Lab data has looked at lots of um, uh, environmental chemicals and, and have um, supported endocrine disruption from certain chemicals. So the lab data is there, but then what happens in the epidemiology setting? So again, part of the epidemiology um, setting, um, most of these meta-analyses have been fairly inconclusive. This is just PCBs. The, these authors went on to look at um, the class of PCBs, and that did moder matter more. But again, the um, uh, magnitude of risk was quite low. So what I would argue is some of what's going on is that um, these past studies haven't really factored in the um, time of life when the breast is developing and more susceptible to carcinogen. And in particular, what I'll just show you today is this fact that most cohorts, when they um, sample for average risk, do not have enough power to detect interactions at the tail or for the very high risk. And so um, particularly for um, exposures that may have modest associations, we really do need to think about um, uh, uh, ways that we can um, have uh, enough precision and power to really look across the spectrum of risk and really have um, the ability then in observational studies, it's not a question of do you have bias, of course you have bias. Every observational study has lots of bias, but it's really how much bias is there and um, is that bias enough to explain away the association. And so that's where the size of effect does matter because most of breast cancer risk factors are quite modest in nature, except for some of the um, ones you more um, hear about, like family history and benign breast disease, which are much larger. These are all very modest. So again, to rule out um, bias, they had to be um, done in many different types of study design, as well as um, uh, consistency across um, uh, uh, different populations and things like that. So those established risk factors that we've known of for many, many decades now um, have been integrated into um, risk models that are useful 
um, in a clinic, and in particular in making decisions about chemopreventive agents like tamoxifen, um, as well as um, thinking about uh, screening and risk-reducing surgery. So I want to just contrast um, two models very briefly. Um, because these are models that are important for thinking about how we integrate environmental risk factors into risk assessment generally. And although I'm using the example of breast cancer, um, I can say that this is true of prostate cancer, colon cancer. Most ca cancer risk models um, largely divide into models that are used in average risk populations and models that are used in high risk. And what I um, don't have enough time to um, show you today, but these models that are used in high-risk populations are just as relevant as these models to average risk as well. So you can use these kind of pedigree models even in uh, women without a family history and get um, better accuracy than some of the other models. So I'm going to just contrast very briefly these two models. And the main um, difference between these two models is this model on the left, the IBIS model, incorporates non-genetic risk factors. Um, and this is the model here, Bodicea, that um, clinics mostly outside of the U.S., but Memorial Sloan Kettering and a few places in the U.S. use this to do risk assessment. And so what you can see probably pretty quickly is that there's a big cluster of data above this diagonal suggesting that this model here is um, leading to higher absolute risk um, estimates than uh, this model here. And that makes sense because it incorporates non-genetic factors. The red dots, however, are all the women who went on to get cancer uh, prospectively, so you can see that neither model really discriminates very well yet. But again, they just have very, um, uh, you know, uh, limited non-genetic risk factors in the one model. So here now is the absolute risk, and this is on average about 10 years after follow-up. You can see that uh, neither model does well because these point estimates are above the diagonal in terms of the, the accuracy of what they're predicting. So mainly the models are missing a chunk of uh, what's actually happening here. So um, again, what we argue is that a lot of what these models are missing in risk assessment in general is environmental factors. So we've used this enriched family-based um, way of studying cancer to look at environmental factors. And so in particular, over time, we've seen um, uh, uh, Biomarkers such as poor DNA repair phenotype, in particular, being quite large, um, measures of oxidative stress and things like that. And what I just want to show you now in the remaining, um, I have three minutes, five minutes, okay, is <laughs> just our results on polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons um, uh, are a lung carcinogen. They're um, suspected to be a cervical cancer carcinogen as well as um, possible breast carcinogen. And so you get exposed to PAHs through a variety of, of um, means, through cooking, through um, air exhaust, diesel exhaust. Um, so, and and uh, studies, this is done by my colleague Rachel Miller, studies of kids in New York City, you can see over time um, uh, the different sources of PAHs, um, these are just urinary metabolites, have been increasing, some of the um, select um, metabolites have been increasing. And so um, over time, um, Starting with the Long Island breast cancer study, PAHs have been measured in traditional kind of case control studies, but albeit very modest kind of um, associations, no clear dose response. When stratified by um, DNA repair phenotype genes, um, so in particular um, ERCC1, um, XRCC1, XPD, so different um, DNA repair phenotype, uh, genotype you do get a, a stronger association, but these are still fairly um, modest associations and all under twofold. So what we went on recently then to do is um, a study, this is just, uh, again, proof of principle, because we're doing it now in the larger cohort of, um, uh, with a 1,200 breast cancer cases. This is just using the um, New York breast cancer cases. But what we did then is use that Bodicea score. So the Bodicea score is a continuous measure uh, predicting risk, but it doesn't involve any non-genetic factors. So it's just based on pedigree, BRCA1 and 2, and any other uh, major genes that you would know of in any of the families. Um, and uh, so you get a, a continuous score, and then what we did was look at their pH level. So um, we compared, for example, these are women who are at the 90th percentile for um, PAH exposure, and then you can see, based on their underlying um, breast cancer risk, you can see a very strong association for people who have high levels of exposure, but then also have high levels of risk. So the women who are um, at this end of the spectrum are not just BRCA1 and 2 carriers, um, because that was only about 10 percent of our sample, but again, they probably have DNA repair mutations in, in other um, 
uh, related genes that would make them more susceptible to the um, to carcinogens like PAHs. And you can see then for, for people who have low level of exposure, even though they have high risk here, you see that much more modest effect that we're getting in population-based cohorts. So again, it's, it's a more of a proof of principle, but it is supporting that these modest effects we're seeing from environmental exposures um, and cancer risk are, um, are mainly what you would ex expect to see you know, at a population-wide level. But when you get large exposure and high risk, uh, um, that you see much stronger effects. So again, the reason why we would care about looking at the strength of effect is with all these optional observational data, there's always going to be bias. Um, and so the um, ways that we can think about having enough power and precision both to um, estimate things across the spectrum, then um, the, the better we are at um, making sure um, uh, we've been able to really test a gene-environment interaction. So the, in conclusion, most of the uh, causal factors for cancer are found through observational designs. We can use these family-based cohorts as an efficient design to investigate gene and environment interaction. And the larger the associations, the less likely they're driven by bias. Um, and just like with genes, um, finding a gene in a family-based study, if we find environmental factors are um, within these family-based settings, that then can be generalizable to those without a family history. Thank you.